Good evening. It's certainly good to be gathered together this evening, and I trust you've got your Bibles and that you'll be taking them out and be turning to 1 Kings chapter 13. That will be the text that we'll draw our attention to tonight. 1 Kings chapter 13 will be that key text. Before we begin this evening, I do want to say I do appreciate the invitation that was extended to me by the elders here to come and to be with you today and to be able to open up the Word of God and to present lessons from God's Word. And I hope that you've been encouraged through the things that we've considered this morning and I hope you'll continue to be encouraged through the things that we consider tonight as we study together from God's Word. Anybody who's lived very long at all has probably learned a lesson in life in which they wish they had learned sooner. We've all probably learned some lesson that we say, I wish I had known that sooner and maybe it would help me in some situation, some area of my life. Maybe it is you're somebody who runs a business and maybe some business practice that you said, if I had known that sooner, that could have helped me in running my business. Maybe you think about something that had to do with your health. And maybe it is you say, if I had known that about my health sooner, maybe I could have done something to improve my health or to ensure better health and longevity in life. I'm certain, I'm certain, I'm positive that we could probably all think of some other examples of things that we have learned and we learned too late in life. And it's certainly sad when we have to say that there is some lesson that we learn too late to benefit, too, too late to gain anything from it. There was one story that was told, we'll use this as an example for the beginning of our study this, morning, this evening, of a man who was about to be hung for the crimes that he had committed. And when asked if, if he had any final statement, he said, I want you all to know this sure is going to be a lesson to me. And he learned that lesson too late. Having said we learned a lesson too late, again, is certainly a saddening fact. But it is something that could be said of the young prophet in the text in 1 Kings chapter 13. In 1 Kings chapter 13, we find a young prophet who learned some valuable lessons. But he learned those lessons too late. I want you to notice that the person that we're talking about in 1 Kings chapter 13 is not described as some kind of arrogant person. We're not talking about somebody who is a godless person who who threw away his life in worldliness and in sin. We're not talking about somebody who claimed to have no time for God. In fact, the kind of person we're talking about is described in 1 Kings chapter 13 and in verse 1 as a man of God. And in 1 Kings 13 and verse 1, he said, And behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. The person that we're talking about tonight is going to be a person who is described as a man of God. And this is certainly a man, as we read through the story and we'll look at tonight, as a man of great courage and a man of great bravery. As he risked his own life in going in before King Jeroboam in order to defend against this these golden calves that King Jeroboam has put up. And he goes in to defend against those golden calves. And as he goes before the king, the king could have simply put him to death. But he goes in with great courage in order to defend against what he had done. But as the story begins, we look and as we read through verse 1 through 10, and we read about a great man of God. But as the story continues in the latter part, here's a man who fails in his, in, in, who fails in his mission that was given. And ultimately, his disobedience to God ultimately brings forth his death in the remainder in the final part of the story. It's easy for us to look at 1 Kings 13, as we will tonight, and look just at the good side of this young prophet. To look at his bravery, to look at his courage, to look at him going in before the king. But we may also look and see his failures. We also could look and see what things he failed at and things he learned too late and learned some valuable lessons from them. It's doubtful that many of us, if any, would measure up to certainly not surpass the devotion and the courage that this young prophet manifested in the first part of this story. But as we think about this story, this man again becomes the object of God's displeasure. Because Satan has defeated him and has defeated him on his weakest front. 
And I'm sure that if we had the opportunity to talk to the young prophet and ask him if he had the chance to do it all over again, would he have done some things differently? He probably would. He'd probably change some things he did. But as we all know, we don't get second chances in life. But the man of God learned some lessons too late to benefit from them. But we can look at those lessons that he learned too late, and I hope that we can this evening benefit from these lessons. As we look at the young prophet of 1 Kings 13 and think about some lessons he learned too late. Let's consider some of those lessons together here this evening. I want to begin by saying I believe the young prophet, as we read through the story, learned the valuable lesson too late that God is not an author of confusion. God is not an author of confusion. In the text in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and in verse 33, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and in verse 33, the text says, For God is not an author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Here in 1 Kings 14, the text tells us that He is not an author of confusion. In the text recorded for us in Hebrews chapter 6 and in verse 18, we are told that God cannot lie. And as we look at what the younger prophet has convinced himself of, as he has convinced himself that God would tell him one thing and would tell the older prophet in the latter part of the story something different. But we know that that's not the case because God does not lie. And if God would tell one person one thing and another person something else, He would have had to have been lying to one of them. And we know that God cannot do that. For the text says in Hebrews 6 and in verse 18 that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope that is set before us. God cannot and does not lie. In Romans chapter 2 and in verse 11, we are told that God shows no partiality. And it goes back to that idea that if God would tell one person one thing and would tell another person something else, He would be showing partiality to one over another. And God does not do that. I want to suggest to you that as this young prophet has convinced himself of this idea that God would tell one person one thing and another person something else, we have that within the world we live in today. When we have people saying one thing over here and another person saying something different somewhere else. You could go somewhere today if you wanted to and somebody would teach you something totally different than I teach or Donnie teaches on the subject of the plan of salvation and what one must do in order to be saved. You can go somewhere else and you'll hear somebody teach things about how one doesn't have to be baptized in order to be saved. Or how baptism is just sprinkling, it's not immersion. You could go somewhere and you could hear those things. When we have one person saying one thing and one person saying something else, we ultimately have confusion. And again, the young prophet had convinced himself that God would contradict himself. I want to point that out to you very quickly. you got your Bibles open there in 1 Kings chapter 13. Let's begin reading together in verse 8. I want you to notice that Here's this young prophet as he goes to King Jeroboam. And he goes before King Jeroboam and he defends against these golden calves that King Jeroboam has put up. And when King Jeroboam ultimately determines that... When King Jeroboam tells him to arrest um, this young prophet, the text tells us that his hand, when he stretched it out toward him, he could not pull it back to himself. And the altar was split apart, and the ashes were poured out. According to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord in verse 5. And in verse 6 he said, Then king answered and said to the man of God, Please entreat the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored. And his hand was restored to him. But as the text goes on, the text tells us that then King Jeroboam invites this young prophet to come home with him, to come in with him. But the man of God answers in verse 8 through 9 and says to the king, If you were to give me half your house, I will not go in with you, nor would I eat bread, nor drink water in this place. For so it was commanded to me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall not eat bread, nor drink water, nor return by the way you came. Here the young prophet says, This is the command that was given to me my God. I cannot go in with you, I cannot eat bread, and I cannot drink water, and I cannot return by the way of which I came. 
And I want you to notice that this young prophet recognized and knew that this message was a God-given message. He knew that this message was given to him by God. He said, I was commanded by the word of the Lord. But I also want you to notice that there was a sign that was given to confirm that this mission that was given to this young prophet was a a God-given mission. In 1 Kings chapter 13 and in verse 3, backing up into verse 3, it says, And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar shall split apart and the ashes on it shall be poured out. You go to verse 5 and guess what happens? Here's that sign to prove that this message was given by God. The altar, the altar in verse 5 was also split apart. And the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Here's this mission that, this, um, here is this sign that proves that the message that was given to him was a God-given message. But we read further on in the story and here he comes to an older prophet now. He wouldn't go in with the king but now he comes to an older prophet. And the older prophet looks at him and tells him that he has heard this different message, that he's been told something different. I want you to notice what the text says there beginning in verse 15. Then he said to him, come home, and eat, come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I cannot return with you nor go in with you, neither can I eat bread nor drink water with you in this place, for I have been told by the word of the Lord, you shall not eat bread nor drink water there nor return By going the way you came. Again, he points out the same thing he does to the king. I can't go in with you. But the older prophet looks at him and said to him, I too am a prophet. We'll come back to that phrase in just a moment and discuss it further. And he says, as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord saying, "Bring, bring him back to your house that he may eat bread and drink water. You notice what it said next? He was lying to him. So he went back with him and he ate bread in his house and he drank water. He hears this message from this older prophet that says, I too am a prophet and this is what I was told. I was told a different message than you were told. And what he has convinced himself of is he has convinced himself that God would tell him something different than he told the older prophet and that God would contradict himself. I want you to notice that the devil tries to get us when we're most vulnerable. And I believe he does that in this story here with this younger prophet. The younger prophet, you think about him in this story as he's been traveling. He must have been hungry. And so here's this temptation. You can come in with me. You can eat water. You can eat bread with me and drink water with me. Here's this temptation. And he falls into that temptation as we see in the story. Remember a a similar temptation to that when the devil tempted Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 when he said that he had been fasting 40 days and 40 nights? And he says, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. If you're truly hungry, command these stones to become bread. And he tempted Jesus. Of course, Jesus didn't fall into that temptation, but the young prophet did. He tries to get us when we're most vulnerable and tries to get us to come to Him. As we read through this story, we begin to look at the younger prophet and you see, he learned a valuable lesson too late. God is not an author of confusion. He didn't tell him one thing and he didn't tell the older prophet something different. Secondly, I believe this young prophet learned the valuable lesson too late that religious leaders don't always tell the truth. I told you we'd come back to that text there where he said, I too am a prophet. This older prophet comes to him when he says, I cannot go in with you. I can't eat bread and drink water with you nor return by the way of which you came. And he comes to him and said, I too am a prophet. And this is what I was told. And he gives him some new message. And the younger prophet didn't question whether or not he was telling the truth. If you're truly a prophet, oh, you, you must be telling the truth. Since you're a prophet, you must be telling me the truth. So I, I can just listen to anything that you say and I can trust it. Some say or may say 
Well, well, I'm the preacher, so, so you can just listen to me. I can promise you, as I preach, I want you to get your Bible out and I want you to investigate what I say. I want you to see if it is the truth. Because sometimes there are those who don't tell the truth. Religious leaders don't always tell the truth. Many believe this idea that he wouldn't lie or he surely knows what he's talking about. The young prophet learned that that can't work that way because the older prophet was lying to him. And we are told that we ought to investigate everything that we hear. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and in verse 21, he said, test all things, hold fast what is good. The noble Bereans... In Acts chapter 17, they were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness. And they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether the things were so. They, they were ready and they were opening their Bible and they were searching the scriptures. They were investigating what was said to see if it was true. And so I asked the question, who should we investigate? Who should, who should I open my Bible and see if they're telling the truth? And the answer is I should test everyone. You say, well, well, I, I know Donnie. I know Donnie's going to get up here and preach. I, I trust Donnie. He's going to tell the truth. No, I need to open my Bible and I need to investigate what he says. Whether I think Donnie's going to preach the gospel, the, the truth or not, I need to be able to open my Bible and to see whether or not what he is saying is the truth. I need to investigate everyone. I want you to notice what this older prophet claimed when he comes to this younger prophet. What he claims is he claimed that he had a more up-to-date revelation. He had some new up-to-date revelation. This is a claim that is made repeatedly today within the religious world. Then people like the Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons, and you talk about people who have this new, they talk about how they received this up-to-date revelation. Joseph Smith talks about how he received this new message. The, young, the older prophet tells him, There's, here's something new that I have. I got something newer than you have. We don't have a new up-to-date revelation. What this is right here is what we need. In Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6, he said, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who calls you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. You know what I need? I need this right here. I don't need no up-to-date relations. I don't need something new. I don't need something different. I need this right here. People want to say that the, the Bible or, and other things have changed in order to fit the way things are today. The Bible accepts new, different ideas. The Bible hasn't changed. This is what we need right here. And it's not going to, we don't need a new up-to-date revelation. And he learned the valuable lesson here, the young prophet did, that religious leaders don't always tell the truth. I'll tell you another lesson this young prophet learned too late. Is he learned the valuable lesson too late that sincerity is no excuse for disobedience. Sincerity is no excuse for disobedience. As we read through the story of 1 Kings 13 and this young prophet, no one can doubt the sincerity of this of him. No one can doubt that he was sincere when he goes in and he faced danger and risked his life with the king's wrath as he goes before him in order to defend against these golden calves that he has put up. No one can doubt the fact that this man was sincere when he turned down the offer of royalty, when that offer of royalty was given to him in order to be loyal to God instead. And I believe this young prophet was sincere in what he thought. Even when he goes before the older prophet and the older prophet invites him to come in and says, here's this new message, I think the younger prophet was probably sincere in what he thought. But sincerity is not enough and is no excuse for disobedience. 
As we think about the sincerity of this young prophet, I want you to notice that this sincerity didn't help because in the end of the story, ultimately he dies for his disobedience unto God. We all know that when we think about sincerity and when we, know, when we talk about natural law, when one violates natural laws, sincerity is not enough to save us. A couple examples that we'll use for the sake of time. Let's take for a moment and imagine this person that sits there and says, well, here, here's this thing of poison that's sitting right there. And I sincerely believe and I sincerely think that I can take that poison and I can drink it or do something else with it, but it's not going to harm me at all. Guess what? That sincerity in thinking that is not going to save them when they do that. Another example that, was used, that it could be used is imagine this person that's driving up on a bridge where there used to be a bridge and as they drive up on that bridge they sincerely think that there is a bridge there. But there's not a bridge there anymore because that bridge has been washed out. Guess what? If they keep driving and there's no bridge there, guess what? Sincerity and thinking there was a bridge there is not going to save them. They're still going to plummet down and they're still going to die. Sincerity does not help us when it comes to natural law. So we ask the question, when will people begin to learn that sincerity in religion, although important is not enough by itself in order to save us from our disobedience unto God. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Let me read your text to us all. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. He says, there are going to be those that stand before me and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And they are going to sincerely think that what we have done is what was right. And we have faithfully served the Lord. The Lord says, I'm going to have to say to them on that day, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. There's going to be those that are sincere, but it will not help. Matthew chapter 15 and in verse 14. He said, let them alone. There are blind leaders of the blind. And if blind leads the blind, both will fall into the dead. We think about the blind leading the blind. There could be that blind leader who sincerely thinks that what he's doing is right, but he's not right. And that one that's following him could sincerely think that what they're doing is right. But the text tells us that if if there's blind leaders of the blind, both will fall into the ditch. Sincerity is not enough. Sincerity is no excuse for disobedience. And I believe the young prophet, as he looks at himself, and he looks back, he learned that valuable lesson too late. Let me tell you another lesson I think this young prophet learned too late, and I believe he learned the valuable lesson too late, that yesterday's obedience doesn't atone for today's disobedience. Yesterday's obedience doesn't atone for today's disobedience. God doesn't overlook today's disobedience as because of our obedience in the past. It is often easy for us as we think about ourselves to dwell in the accomplishments of the past and what we have done and the things that we, that, that we have done in the past. But if we don't remain faithful to the Lord, yesterday's obedience doesn't help and will not atone for today's disobedience. The young prophet, as you look at this story, you begin reading through it and you say, here's this great man of God who goes in before the king and defends against these golden calves. And you say, what a great man of God. And he's obeyed the first part of the mission that was given to him. And then you come to the end and he disobeys God in the latter part of this mission. Guess what? 
since he didn't fulfill the last part of the mission, it, his obedience at the beginning of the mission didn't atone for the last part. He ultimately again dies for his disobedience unto God. God requires of us all continual obedience. The text in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and in verse 58. He said, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. He says, I expect you to continually abound, always abounding, continual growth in your service to God. In Revelation chapter 2 and in verse 10, we are told that we need to be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. You need to be faithful until death. What that tells you and me is that I need to be faithful to the Lord, not just today, not just tomorrow, but every day of my life, the Lord requires continual obedience. I can't say, well, yesterday I, I was obeying you. Yesterday's obedience doesn't atone for today's disobedience. And I believe the young prophet learned that valuable lesson too late. One final lesson I think this young prophet learned too late, and that is that partial obedience isn't obedience at all. Again, you look at the young prophet, and he successfully completes the first part of his mission. We think about it, and he goes in before the king, and he defends against the golden calves that he has put up. And here we see this great man of God. But if the story had ended at verse 10, it would have been a great story. But as the story unfolds, the second part of his mission, just as vital as the first, he did not obey what the Lord had told him. Both parts of his mission, I want you to notice, were God-given missions. When he was given that sign, he was told that these were, he was given a sign that proved that these were God-given missions. And the latter part was just as important as the first. But he didn't obey the Lord on his return trip, and ultimately he dies for his disobedience unto God. To, pr to talk about this idea of partial obedience, I want to use one final text, and I believe it brings this idea home. If you turn to your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 15. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, we'll begin reading there in verse 3. King Saul was told in this text to go and to utterly destroy the Amalekites. But as we read in the story, he doesn't obey all that the Lord had, all that he was commanded. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, let's begin reading there in verse 3. Now, God in, now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. And do not spare them. But kill both man and women, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Here he's given a command. Seems like a very simple command, a very straightforward command. This is what you are expected to do. As we look down in verse 13 of the text, in 1 Samuel 15. In verse 13 the text tells us, Then Samuel went to Saul and said to him, Blessed are you the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? If you fully did what the Lord commanded you, what's this bleeding of the, of the sheep that I hear in my ear? The text tells us down in verse 19. He said, Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? And why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? You look at that story and he did some of what the Lord had told him. He did some of it. But he spared some people. And he didn't fully do what the Lord had told him to do there in 1 Samuel 15. And you say, well he did part of it. He did part of what the Lord said. But he didn't do all that he said. And I believe we learned from 1 Samuel chapter 15 that partial obedience doesn't suffice. It's not enough. Because partial obedience really isn't obedience 
at all. And so we ask a question. Have you or I, as a member of the church, contented ourselves with this idea of partial obedience? Partial obedience to what the Lord says. I'll do some of what He says, but there, maybe there's something I just don't like, and I'm not going to do it all. Have we contented ourselves with that? Partial obedience doesn't suffice. I must obey the Lord, and I must do all that He says. I believe as the young prophet learns in this lesson, even though he did some of it, he didn't do all. And partial obedience really isn't obedience at all. Lessons learned too late. The young prophet learned some valuable lessons. He learned some valuable lessons, but unfortunately and sadly, he learned some of them too late. What did he learn? He learned that God is not an author of confusion. He didn't tell him something and tell the older prophet something different. He learned that religious leaders don't always tell the truth. He said, I too am a prophet, but guess what? He was lying to him. He learned that sincerity is no excuse for disobedience. Yesterday's obedience doesn't atone for today's disobedience. And partial obedience really isn't obedience at all. Hopefully we can take those lessons and use them in our own life and benefit from them before it is too late. It may be that there's one more present here this evening who's not a Christian, who's not a child of God. Would you come this evening believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Would you repent of your sins, confess your faith, and be buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of sins? If you're subject to the invitation in any way, would you come? All together we stand and while we sing.